Hello everyone, this is Dr. Paz and welcome back to our virtual classroom. We are now in week nine or module nine, so we are going to get started. We are in the home stretch here, as you can see, only week nine and 10 left. And this week we are looking at preparing the report and reading chapter 12. So we will start with reading chapter 12, preparing the report, and then downloading our PowerPoint to go over for this virtual classroom. And keep in mind that as I start, you know, going over the PowerPoint that I will have prompts for you throughout this um, virtual classroom so that you can submit. So let me open our PowerPoint here in a minute, and then we will get started. I hope everyone is starting out the week fabulous with a lot of fabulous fun and we will get started here. Let me put this in slideshow mode so it'll start doing the subtitles here and hopefully that would be helpful. So this is a night shift undercover and I thought that was a lovely picture and I just wanted to share that. So let's start with our chapter 12 preparing the report. So by day, she sells bait and snacks from a shack near Black Creek and by night, but at night, she goes undercover. So unlike detective stories, romance novels, and many forms of popular writing, which are produced for the pleasures of individuals, writing about research results is undertaken to contribute to the general human knowledge and welfare. So. I publish several manuscripts or several papers a year. In fact, this year, I think I have seven total. And basically what we're doing there is we're trying to add to the scholarly uh, work, right? And we're trying to add to the literature, which we call a literature review, some evidence, hopefully empirical evidence based on the scientific method and testing of hypotheses. So the first aspect of your assignment is, would you consider doing research? So one, you would answer, would you consider doing research and publishing your papers? So is that something that you are fond of? Are you fond of writing and researching or do you prefer to write a detective story or a romance novel? I would like to write both. I, I do publish for manuscripts now and you know papers for my scholarly contributions, but I would also like to write like a novel or write for pleasure, but I haven't found the time yet. <laughs> So this chapter summarizes the final step in the research process, which is the report of your findings. So as emphasis in several chapters, a critical feature of science is that the findings are public and subject to a formal peer review process. So the aspect of scientific research does not guarantee actual results, but it does comprise a built-in corrective mechanism. So when you think of the peer review process, typically when you are publishing manuscripts in scholarly journals like I do, you have a double blind peer review process. And what that is, is basically two reviewers um, are, review your work, but it's blind. They don't know who you are and you as the writer of the manuscript do not know who the reviewers are. And they give you recommendations and they give the editor of the journal a recommendation to publish your paper as it is or to minor revisions or a revise and resubmit or the deadly do not publish and you know reject the paper now you sometimes can get desk rejected which is your paper is rejected by the editor of the journal and typically that means that it either doesn't fit the journals um, or it's not the correct paper for that type of journal or you did not adhere to the submission guidelines or the formatting and the editor is just not going to worry about it with you. So, but a double blind peer review process is typically what we experience as writers with a lot of scholarly journals in my, and that's what I've experienced in all of my publications. So it also illustrates an important contrast. Common sense information spreads among individuals compared to the public nature of science.
So there are three types of research reports. So the chapter goes into the three types of research reports that are most commonly prepared by student researchers. So the first kind is the research-based journal article and similar papers around um, the journal articles. Two is a conference report and three is a poster display. And once we get done with this PowerPoint, I will show you on my website all of these kinds of papers. Mostly I have under my publications, the research-based journal articles, and then I will show you the poster displays of several articles that I present on the scholarship of teaching and learning. So you will make a decision on those when I, we go to the website. So in the appendix, it pretty much provides detailed information and it gives you excerpts from three other major types of written reports where you have the monograph or you have a governmental report and an evaluation report. And it describes the components of what's known as a qualitative and a quantitative report. Keep in mind that qualitative information is typically words, whereas quantitative information are calculations or numbers. So all six types of reports convey three key aspects of report writing. First is the importance and the variety of formal research reports. Next, we have the organization of the reports. And lastly, the content of the reports. So we have importance and variety, organization, and content. So the next part of this assignment is out of which of the six types of reports, the research-based journal article, the conference paper, the poster display, the monograph, the governmental report, and the evaluation report, which of these six is your favorite and why? So that is your next part of your assignment is of the six types of research reports, please pick one as your favorite and why did you choose that? And then of the four aspects of report writing, right, or the three aspects really, importance and variety, organization and content, which do you feel is again amongst the most important? So I tend to pick the research-based journal articles because that is what I tend to write. That probably would be my favorite or the poster display. And um, of the areas, I think the content of the report is probably the most important as that is what conveys the empirical evidence. So that's my answer to those questions. Hopefully I look forward to learning what your answers to those questions are in your assignment. So let's continue discussing ways of preparing the report, our research report, and we have five suggestions for writing these reports. So these suggestions um, were written to inform qualitative research, but they're also more, more generally apply to scholarly writing. So you are telling a story and your own writing style can be used. And that's important. You want to tell a story and you want to show the importance of that story because that you want to captivate your readers. So if you don't have a writing style or you don't know whether you have one, a good approach is to think about what you would need to know in order to understand your own project if someone else were describing it to you. And how can you make your topic interesting to your readers? That's the other question that you're going to answer for your virtual classroom assignment. How can you make your topic interesting to your readers? You can try by starting your research problem or stating your research problem in the form of like an interesting question. An example is, are children who take responsibility for their care of their pets more likely than other children to volunteer for community service? So the other aspect of the assignment that you'll answer for your virtual classroom is how can you make your 
topic interesting to your readers and then give an example of an interesting question like you see here. So do not use the question in this PowerPoint, but definitely provide um, an interesting question similar to the one that you see here. Are children who take responsibility for their care of their pets more likely than other children to volunteer for community service and provide what you would think? You know, so what would be your interesting question? <coughs> All right, back to our five suggestions for writing reports. Here we are with number two. Begin writing early, even before beginning data collections. Scholar and author Harry Wilcock asks, are you a writer or an ought to be writing writer? So he suggests writing an early draft even before beginning the research. You don't have to show it to anyone. Having something on paper, even if most of it is changed, will encourage you to work on it. And starting the writing early likely will help you define the research goals and activities. So try writing to yourself in order to help pin down your thoughts. Use short sentences and paragraphs. Explain your goals and how you plan to collect your data. For example, if your goal is to describe adoptive parents' perceptions of an infant adoption process, how will you locate adoptive parents? How will you obtain data from them? And what do you think you might find? So the next aspect of your assignment is to answer that question from Harry Walcock. Are you a writer or an ought to be writing writer? Which type of writer are you? I would say I'm an ought to be writing writer because I think I should be writing all the time and it really takes me a while to get into that research frame of mind and under, you know, and then start writing. But I do agree to just sit down and write and take um, some time in your day to write. And then once you just start sitting down and writing, it does seem to flow. And as you are putting your words down on paper or on a computer screen, it does help you to kind of hone in on your research problem and see how you're gonna collect the data. So that is the next part of your assignment is to answer Harry Wilcox's question, are you a writer or ought to be writing writer? So now we have three of five in our five suggestions for research report writing, right? So you wanna keep an accurate record of what you read and the full citation and reference information for each source. You definitely will not want to scramble for this information when you're finishing your paper. So citations are references within the body of a paper that identify the source of an idea, a fact, or a quotation. So the Sociology Students Writer's Manual and Reader's Guide contains a section on citations that follow the American Sociology Association Style Guide. And references appear at the end of a document as a list of sources that are cited in the paper. So the Sociology Students Writing Manual also explains how to create a bibliography, a list of references at the end of the text where cited or not, whether cited or not. Ooh, let's go back to that. So here we have three different items. And so just keep in mind that in business we use APA, the American Psych Psychology Association um, Site. And then once we're done with this PowerPoint, I will show you on my website, not only my publications and my poster sessions, but I will also show you, I have an APA course on my website, APA 7th. And, um, and then we will, I'll show you that so you could see citations, in-text citations, you'll see a list of references. And, um, and then typically what we do when we are preparing the report, we keep what's known as an annotated bibliography, where you would have the citation and then you would have a little, kind of like the abstract of the paper, but in your own words, how it relates to your research. So it might be interesting, the variables that were used in that paper or the, um, or maybe the methodology or some literature review or so another citation that, um, you know, like another source within the paper that might be helpful for your study. 
Now we move on to four out of our five suggestions for research writing, right? And you wanna cite all sources of ideas, quotes and information not widely known. Everything other than your own thoughts and information that is common knowledge. So TV watching is common in many households and basic knowledge in many sources like per, per, you know, personal computers vary in cost. So obviously we want to avoid plagiarism. So when you're quoting or summarizing someone else's ideas with crediting the source, like the plague, right? So we do not want to plagiarize. You want to make sure you have in-text citations for anything that you've obtained from another source. And you want to make sure that you have that um, source listed, that reference listed in your references cited. So sometimes, typically students do not fully understand how to avoid making such mistakes or the consequences that plagiarism can produce. So the Sociology Student Writer's Manual and Reader's Guide contains a section on how to properly summarize an article to avoid plagiarism. And they use examples from the magazine The Economist or the Rolling Stones magazine. So basically, if in doubt, I would say you definitely want to make sure you have a citation. And a plagiarism, there are tools like Turnitin or iAuthenticate, these are Tool. These are databases that check your work and compare it to sources to see what the originality score is. And you want that score to be low, right? And, and so that way you're showing that you've actually properly cited and that you've given credit to other sources and you didn't use it and you didn't plagiarize. The higher the score in these reports, the more likely that it is plagiarized. So also the American Sociology Association websites offers links to other sources about ethics in writing and about publishing. That is helpful. So another portion of this assignment is to go out to the American Sociology Association and find and go to and find one of those sources about ethics in writing or about publishing or and then provide that in your virtual classroom assignment. And our final fifth um, for preparing reports recommendations is finally, like all writers, you need to read and revise your written drafts several times. And by several times, I mean multiple times. You will, where you begin and where you end a manuscript or a paper is completely different. And editing and revisions and proofreading is a, one of the most important, tedious parts of writing, but it is definitely one of the most important parts of writing. So two helpful and simple tips that will improve your writing more than you might think. Try to avoid insertion of unnecessary words and phrases. For example, don't say, we would argue that. Instead, say, our evidence indicates or the study results show. And two, if you are summarizing an existing research project, use the present test. They find that. The content of the report has not vanished and probably the present tense is more readable, but the past tense is required to describe something that has finished, such as an experiment or a survey. So verb tense is quite important in research writing and definitely you want to write succinctly, right? You want to try to avoid those unnecessary words and write clear and concise um, and present the results hopefully in an organized fashion. So maybe from your writing, you will become famous. I have not yet, unfortunately, but you never know, right? And we have several famous authors and several great books that have come about because of writing. Okay, so let we made it through the PowerPoint. And now what I'd like to show you is on my website. So let's go here to drvpaz.com. And then we will go over my publications, posters, and the APA 7th course that I have on here. And if you click on publications, you will see I have one more that just got published that I have to add. But you'll see here all of my publications and then access to get them. So these are the two articles. These are my books that I recently pu have published. 
And then this is another article that I have here that I need to change that now that I see because it is published now. It's no longer forthcoming. Um, and then we have another published work in 2020 about 10 minute trainings like developing critical thinking skills with logic games in classrooms. And then in 2019, I have two publications. And then in 2018, this is my very first book um, that I co-authored and I have two publications. And then in 2017, this is my first solo publication. And then these are just other, so of all of these, so these are all of my publications as you can see here. And then um, in 2012, that was my dissertation. And then I had two publications in 2009. So out of all of these publications for your virtual classroom assignment, which one do you, would you read? You don't have to read it, but you wanna look at the titles or which one would be the first one that you would read? What did you find interesting? And you see, I have here, I have several varied topics around everything, right? I have agency and shareholder theory, the impact of the International Accounting Standards Board and the Financial Accounting Standards Board on financial statements, my dissertation that was on stock option expensing as part of CEO compensation and earnings quality. Then I talk about granting stock options as part of CEO compensation and the impact of earnings quality and the impact of CEO stock option expensing as for the Statement of Financial Accounting Standards 123R on earnings quality. Both of these came from my dissertation. Then I also talk about the impact of the International Financial Reporting Standards adoption, a literature review. I talk about what can you do as a renegade employee and the impact of the size of board of directors on earnings quality when stock options are expensed as for FAS 123, which was also from my dissertation. And then you see I talk about academic integrity in an online business communication environment. I talk about grade distributions under different testing environments. Then I have innovative new apps and uses for the accounting classrooms. And then an, an update to that, ask the experts, what is the consequences of retaining a renegade employee? And then teaching corporate social responsibility in an MBA, a master's of business administration program. Then this is my book, Costly Reflections in a Midas Mirror. And then I do also talk about teaching sustainability in the accounting classroom. And then these get to be a little fun, right? So building airplanes in an accounting class, an interactive exercise in a managerial cost accounting course, and then using movie clips to help teach accounting principles. And then we also have the 10 minute training game, developing critical thinking skills with logic games. Then I have my other two books, Trapdoors and Trojan Horses, an auditing accounting adventure, and then Computer Encryptions in Whispering Caves and AIS Action Adventure, Accounting Information Systems. Then I did this article on the Impossible Interview, a two-stage interview case for auditing students. Then using a plant tour to teach job order costing. Then I have do core and non-core cash flows from operations persist differently in predicting future cash flows, analysis based on industry membership. And then I have Kahoot gamification in an accounting classroom. So those are all of the publications that I have. So as part of your virtual classroom assignment, pick one that you would possibly read or which one interested you most and why. So that's the item you would put there. So that is all about publications and research report writing, which coincide with what we're doing um, this week in our chapter. And then I wanna show you under events, some poster sessions. And so you could see how that looks a little differently. So I had one presentation here that I have to update, but I want to show you. So here I had eight presentations and um, then I will click here so you could see, and then this will show you all of the poster sessions that I had. And so here I did hybrid or high flex. Does it work using a plant tour to teach job order costing? And then how to use Kahoot as a review tool in accounting classes. And then here you see the actual posters, right? So I have distance learning, teaching tips and best practices. And this was a poster presentation. And then I have adding free writing to auditing, free rights to auditing. And here's another 
poster presentation. And then I did another poster here, providing accounting students with 21st century skills. And then I have another one, time savers, audio and video feedback. And then I have another presentation. Is it possible to interact with students in the virtual classroom? And I'm sure there is, because this is our virtual classroom to, for this week. So these are just some of the poster presentations. So since our chapter discussed publications as one type of writing, and then it discussed the posters and then the conference proceedings as another type of writing, I wanted to give you examples of these posters so that you could see when you do attend conferences, academic conferences, this is pretty much what you would do. You either present, um, as you see here, a file, you know, where it's like a PowerPoint and you're discussing your idea. And hopefully you're doing this in order to get feedback from the those in the audience and see if there is something that isn't clear. And then typically, if you're presenting a paper, then you would have somebody serve as a discussant of the paper. And that means that they've reviewed your paper thoroughly, and then they give you options on how to improve your paper, possibly for publication. So that's the whole purpose of these types of conferences and poster sessions is to hopefully get feedback and get uh, you know, improve your paper and improve if there's anything that is ambiguous. So those are examples of posters. And if you go under events, you can pretty much click where I'll tell you how many presentation files I have. And then you'll see here what I did the presentation and anything that I have and here you could see accessing and the conference programs. And then here, I think I had three presentations. So if you click on here, you'll see the presentation files and then making Excel entertaining and fun, pivoting to plan B and um, using the paperless classroom to teach sustainability and accounting principles and managerial accounting. So there's a ton of, um, every time you see presentations here, then you should hopefully see a file and hopefully that file will show you all of these other items here. So the other portion of your virtual classroom is to pick one of the posters, maybe just copy the image or access the file or just or select the name and put it in your virtual classroom, um, which one of any of the posters that you see under events and any of the presentation files that you see, which one caught your eye. And so that would be um, the last of one of the last portions of your virtual classroom assignment. So, and then the last piece I wanted to cover is under courses, you'll see all of the courses that I have that I teach are out here typically very heavily surrounding accounting, but then you'll also see these seminar courses, which is um, the seminars, those are my PhD classes that I teach that are quite around, you know, all of this research and all of this writing. And so you see here, I have an Excel workshop, data analytics and accounting, but this is the one I wanna show you here is the APA 7th edition and see the American Psychological Association APA formatting style. It's now in the seventh edition and that is typically the citation style that we use in business. So if you click access course, you'll see all of the lessons here about it. And so you'll see how to get started, formatting and style, a title page and then the abstract, the body of the paper, in-text citations, your reference list, and your publication types. So let's start with the title page here. You'll see I just kind of go and tell you how you should do the title page here. And then this file right here is an APA template. Feel free to download it and it'll show you it's basically the Microsoft Word version of what I have up here. So it's already formatted in the proper APA 7th um, style and uh, all of that good stuff. So that is what you see and see titles such as doctor are acceptable, but suffixes such as PhD are usually omitted. And then I give you here links to like the APA um, title page setup. So that is part of the title page. 
And then I want to show you here the abstract is formatting the abstract. And then again, it gives you like it should be on page two of the paper and keywords and then the quality of the keywords. And then so it kind of just details what you should put in the abstract. The word abstract is centered on the page and bolded. So it's just all the formatting that you need for your abstract. And then here the body of the paper right it has headings and then you have you know level one level two level three four and five headings typically i would say we want to stay in level one two and three that doesn't mean it doesn't have to but then this sample paper you'll see a level one and you'll see two and a two headings displayed and if you prefer you can also visit these body pages samples with the word file so you can see all of the different headings and then we have in-text citation. So you need at least one in-text citation for your sources. And here you'll see that um, we usually put them in parentheses. And then, and if we actually put the author's name, you can put the, the year in the end of it. And then you could see when you're quoting how we have P period, not just PG. So just kind of showing in if you have more than one author, if you're actually typing out their name, you see Morris and Woodward here, but if it's in the in-text citation, you have an ampersand sign. So just all the different ways in which to cite. And then if we go back here, you see the reference list and you'll see that and then you see hopefully you have all of these. So that means you would have one in-text citation for all of these and here is the Word document that shows all of that as well. And then the last piece here is the publication types that actually shows you how you should cite them based on if it's a book or an electronic source or what have you. So I hope you found that helpful and I look forward to getting your submissions from the virtual classrooms. Thanks for watching.